Hi, I'm Dr. Todd Lizon. Today, I'm going to be telling you a story, and that may sound a little bit odd, but it's the story of melatonin. Now, bear with me because this story is going to be a little bit long, a little bit convoluted, but very much to the point, and your health depends on it. Your sleep, as you probably know, depends on melatonin, but what you're less likely to know is that your health, specifically your mitochondrial health, absolutely depends on, on melatonin proper function. So bear with me, like I said, this is gonna go a little bit all over the place, but it's critical to understand if you wanna have healthy sleep and healthy, just in general, overall body health. So the story starts with the circadian rhythms. And for those of you that don't know what a circadian rhythm is, these are the natural rhythms, the ebbs and the flows within the body. So one example would be a 28-day menstrual cycle, but another example is the day and the night, the sleep and the wake cycles. And we have very, very distinct circadian rhythms where we should be awake and alert during the day, and then when the sun goes down, we should start to be winding things down, and then we should be falling asleep. When these circadian rhythms are thrown off, a lot of problems can occur. And as most people know, melatonin is quite involved in that. The thing is, we have to look at following what nature has intended, and we violated that to a large extent in less than 150 years. Now, I'm gonna let that soak in for one second. A hundred and less than 150 years ago is when we, invited the, when we invented the, the electrical light bulbs. So prior to 150 years ago, we really didn't have a lot of artificial light other than fires, and I'll come back to fires, or candles. And this is how humans have been designed to function. Over however many number of years we want to sort of talk about, humans were designed to be outside in the day in the light, and then complete darkness, with the exception of firelight. Now, in less than 150 years, we have messed that up. And it's not a coincidence that we're seeing altered health as a result. And that's the story that I want to tell you. And it starts with understanding what that circadian rhythm is. And then it leads into a couple of other questions, which we're going to get to. So let's take a look at this chart that you can see on the screen here beside me. And what this is showing is the pulse of melatonin. So what ends up happening is, as it starts to get dark, around about 6 p.m., we get a pulse of melatonin, a natural pulse of melatonin which is produced. And that pulse, or the amount of melatonin, then builds to a peak, and then it starts to wear off. And as it wears off and eventually completely is gone, we wake up. That's the natural circadian rhythm when it comes to melatonin, is we get a pulse, it reaches a peak where we're sleeping, and then as it wears off, we wake up. What's the problem? There's a few key things that have gone wrong with melatonin and as a result, our health. So just bear with me. You wanna make sure you understand the whole story. The first is blue light. Now, anytime I talk about light, it sounds very airy-fairy to those of you that have never heard about it before, but that's why I explain the circadian rhythm is that we're designed to be stimulated by light in certain ways. Blue light, has a stimulatory function. It stimulates us, it wakes us up, it gets us going. So we require a good, healthy, natural amount of blue light in the mornings. The problem is that these artificial lights that we're exposed to after dark, you know, the LED lights in our homes, the computer screens, the phone screens, even though it doesn't look blue, there's a large percentage of blue light that comes off of those, and that blue light, this is the key point, blocks melatonin function. It stops that initial surge of melatonin, so you never end up reaching the same amount of melatonin that you should naturally producing if you're exposed to blue light in the evenings. So that's the first challenge that melatonin faces. The second challenge is actually nutritional. If you take a look at this picture that I've got up on the screen through here, you're going to notice a few things. The first thing I'll draw your attention to is the hormone melatonin that you can see here. This is what we want to produce to get a good, healthy night's sleep. 
it doesn't magically appear. Your body needs to build it. Now, most people never think about it this way, but it makes sense. And physiologically, it actually is produced from proteins. You need to be eating proteins, and the proteins need to contain this amino acid you see here called tryptophan. Not all foods contain tryptophan. You'll see up here beside the screen some foods that are high in tryptophan. If you're not getting these foods, guess what? You're not going to naturally be able to produce enough melatonin, and you now have a problem. It's more complicated than that though. Keep following through this chart here. You'll see that for the proteins to convert to tryptophan, you need good healthy stomach acid. And with the stomach acid, you actually need zinc B1 and B6, and zinc in particular to help produce the stomach acid. So if there's a problem anywhere in there with, let's say, a lack of zinc, you're going to have problems converting to tryptophan. And that carries on. Tryptophan has to convert to 5-hydroxytryptophan. For that, you need things like iron and folate. There's a lot of defects out there, um, polymorphisms called MTHFR, where people have problems with producing natural folate. That's going to affect their ability to produce melatonin. And then that has to convert again, and eventually it converts to serotonin, which you can see here. Now, most of you realize serotonin is a hormone that is required to help you feel good. They're linked in. Depression, anxiety, sleep, they're all linked in together. And here's the biochemical pathway that helps illustrate how that happens. Now, it actually gets even more complicated than that. So my point there being, you not only need to eat the right foods, you need to have the right nutrients to be able to make the conversions along the way. And any deficiencies in those nutrients will create problems in producing melatonin. It gets more complicated. Take a look at this bottom chart through here, which with all these X's. And if you look here, what this is actually showing is that mercury here, for example, which is extremely toxic to the body, neurotoxic, that actually blocks iron and zinc and B12 and melatonin function. It blocks melatonin function because it's blocking iron and zinc. And when you look back in the chart here, you can see that you require iron and zinc in multiple spots to be able to create the melatonin. So toxins block the ability of the body to create melatonin. So we now have a three-fold problem with melatonin, and that's why this story is quite complicated. It's not so simple. You can't just block out blue light. You have to make sure that you then have the right nutrients and all the ability to create the melatonin, and you need to make sure that you don't have a toxicity problem that's blocking the ability of your body to make the melatonin. This all leads to no doubt sleep problems, but also to overall health problems, significant health problems. And it also impacts your mitochondria in a very significant way. It turns out that we require melatonin to have proper functioning mitochondria, which is what produces your energy in your body. This is a really important area in understanding melatonin because it's not about just sleep. And that's why this story is a little convoluted and everyone seems to only tell little bits and pieces of it. You require melatonin for proper mitochondrial health. Now, some of the ways that it actually helps with mitochondrial health has to do with antioxidant actions. Antioxidants are what basically gets rid of the free radicals. These are the damaging molecules that are formed when we go through cellular respiration. And the way that it works is it primarily produces something called glutathionine. Glutathionine works in the mitochondria. There's not a lot of antioxidants, if any, that work in the mitochondria. And glutathionine is phenomenally important in destroying some of these re radicals. In addition, what it's showing that the melatonin actually can do is not only cleaning up the free radicals, but it can help to prevent the free radicals from forming in the first place. So that's a second really, really critical area that glutathionine and, and melatonin can actually work. Another function that melatonin will actually have is it is needed in the electron transport chain, which is where it's the last steps in producing this energy in the body called ATP. 
and melatonin is required in some of the four complexes of the electron transport chain to allow that to move through smoothly. So without melatonin, there's sort of spanners thrown into the works. The gears start to grind to a halt. It's also got an interesting property when it comes to cancer. It seems to be related to the um, sort of auditing system of the body. So when your cells start to mutate and create a, 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 a cancer type of scenario, melatonin seems to have the ability to sort of audit those cells and it's part of the ability for your body to do apoptosis, which is where it kills off the cancerous cells. So without melatonin, we're actually seeing problems with increased cancer. It's linked in heavily in the research to probably more the estrogen cancer. So you're seeing it in prostate and breast cancer in particular. So an anti-cancer effect is something that melatonin is also really, really important with. And finally, we're looking at things like anti-aging. I'm going to show you some graphs here where you can see how it's significantly impacting our overall health when it comes to things like glucose monitoring, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. There's a lot of these the chronic anti-aging things that come into effect and melatonin has a very significant anti-aging effect. So much so that they've been able to actually increase the lifespan of some mice um, when they've been able to implant some cells that have been impacted by, by melatonin. So this creates a picture that's not all that good. I mean, we require melatonin for our health. We've seen the problems that happen if we don't have it, including our sleep. What do we do? It turns out there's a lot that we can do to increase our natural melatonin production. And it comes back to addressing those three challenges that I spoke about previously. And the first has to do with blue light. After 6 p.m. when the sun goes down, you need to get rid of all that stimulatory blue light. And the best way to do it these days is to wear these blue blocking glasses. They're, they appear to be yellow or orange and they block out all of the stimulatory blue and blue-green wavelengths that can actually decrease your melatonin production. So you simply wear these after dark, it gets rid of the blue light, and that way your melatonin is allowed to naturally build and have that initial pulse. The second way we need to start dealing with these things is with our nutrition. We need to ensure that we're eating the right proteins. We need to ensure that we don't have any deficiencies because it actually turns out that magnesium and zinc are very important to produce melatonin. Do something like a hair tissue mineral analysis. You need to assess the levels of your minerals to see where they're at. And you can see on the, on the screen through here, here's an example of a hair tissue mineral analysis. And you can see in this person, they're quite low in magnesium, they're quite low in zinc. They've got an element of, of, of uh, mercury that's present as well, which blocks the ability of the body to use things like zinc, they're in trouble because they're going to have difficulty in producing the natural amount of melatonin. So from this, we can then prescribe customized nutritional programs, including food and diet, but also sometimes key supplements. And some of the literature out there in elderly people have shown that supplementation with zinc, magnesium, and melatonin can make a massive difference to sleep and overall health. It was an Italian study. And the other thing we need to do is using the same test that you can see again up through here is look for toxic metals and chemicals. And the hair analysis is a great way to assess what's going on with toxic metals. It has some limitations, but it's a great tool to be able to use. And then you need to start detoxifying the body so that you don't have these issues with the toxicity. Now the last bit is the bit that you'd expect from me, which is all about photobiomodulation or PBM for short. Photobiomodulation very quickly increases energy production and it does a lot of really positive things in the body. It's the application of red and near infrared light. Now, we talked about blue light. In the traditional society of before 150 years ago when we had these artificial lights, what did we do after dark? Essentially, we were huddled around fires or candles or really very, very minimal else. It was all about darkness. And perhaps there's some sort of connection between fires and humans, and we require this red and near-infrared light after dark to increase melatonin production because 
Guess what? Melatonin is not produced just in the pineal gland in the brain. It's actually produced in multiple other systems throughout the body. In fact, if you get rid of the pineal gland in the brain, you still produce um, melatonin. This melatonin is actually stimulated by red and near-infrared light. And there's a few studies that have come out in the last little while that show when you're exposed to the near-infrared photobiomodulation, your melatonin levels rise. And as a result, your sleep gets better. And they actually studied this and they found that the quality of the sleep also improved in addition to the increase in the melatonin. I personally think that we are designed to be exposed to the red and the near-infrared light either through the sunset at the end of the day or through the campfire and the red and the near-infrared light. But regardless, when you use this as a therapy at the end of the day, it increases your melatonin. And the way you do it as a therapy is either sit in front of the LED panels that you can see up here, or my personal preference, because it's essentially mimicking fire, is to sit in front of a near-infrared sauna. You're getting the heat you're getting the red light, you're getting the near-infrared light, and you're mimicking what perhaps nature has intended for us to do. And I personally know, and the people I work with over the last eight or nine years with these near-infrared saunas know, that sleep improves dramatically in addition to all kinds of aspects of health. When you do use these saunas on a regular basis, in particular in the evenings. So there you have it. I hope I've addressed as many points as possible about melatonin, about sleep, uh, about overall mitochondrial health. The photobiomodulation is a tremendous tool to help with mitochondrial health, um, as is the hair analysis, the blue blocking glasses. All of these things can improve your sleep, it improves your health, and is definitely worthwhile looking into. Make sure you subscribe to our channel to get more videos just like this as we try to release videos every week or two. You can hit that little alarm bell and then you'll get the video sent to you automatically. If you've got questions, definitely reach out to us. We'll try to help you with as much of that as possible. And always check out our website for more information in the Learning Center in particular. And that'll get you all started up on photobiomodulation and what you need to know. Melatonin, blue light, red light, Absolutely critical. Until next time, keep well.